think what we're seeing in the West today is a renaissance of story. And we are having our kind of explosion like the South had in the 30s, I think. Now the Western uh, uh, writers uh, are more independent. So maybe there is a, a uh, renaissance. I think it's just so wonderful that there's this, this flourishing of, um, of Western regional art. There's a whole passel of good writers living and working and writing about the American West. <laughs> talk about essences of the West, of uh, big canvas uh, with hard lives being lived against it, uh, I never had to look very far uh, to find that kind of material. My dad was a ranch hand, he'd been both cowboy and sheep man, and my mother was, uh, was a ranch cook. And on my sixth birthday, mother's lifelong asthma uh, at last killed her. She died at age 31. And so out of that came my growing up uh, at my, my dad's side as he uh, worked in his, his ranch hand jobs, uh, entertained himself in the nine saloons of White Sulphur Springs, Montana. That's where I got my love for lingo and characters, I think, is what I now see as the good fortune of uh, being a, an honorary adult in those saloons when I was only six and seven and eight and nine years old. 31, God damn you. Darn you. When I was doing my first book, This House of Sky, one of the things I did was sit down with five by eight file cards and begin remembering what things were called. Uh, growing up on a sheep ranch, as I, as I had, I uh, tried to think, all right, what did we call those little pens that we put the ewes in when they had their lambs? Jugs. Uh-huh. And how did, what did we bring them in uh, to the shed before we jugged them? Uh-huh, the gut wagon. You know, and so all of a sudden, you've got these two uh, very uh, powerful uh, pieces of memory as well as strong words uh, to go with. Well, you multiply that by several thousand file cards and you begin to have uh, the makings of a book. Um, to me, language is, is the point of all this, that uh, the dance of language on the page is what literature is all about. To me, the fact that many of us grew up in, well, really as, as American peasants, out there uh, gives us something very strong to write about. February was identical to the frigid misery of January. At the very start of the last of its four white weeks, there came the day when Rob and I found 15 fresh carcasses of ewes, dead of weakness and a constant cold. No, not right. Dead, most of all, of hunger. I glance at Rob as we drove the sled past the gray bumps of dead sheep. Don't work me over with your eyes, man, he told me. How in hell was I supposed to know that the biggest winter since snow got invented was on its way? Tell it to the sheep, Rob, I said to him. Then they'd have at least that to chew on. Much of the history of the American West is change. Change is all around. That's what uh, that's been one of the great topics for us to write about. It's uh, uh, it's in our family trees. Uh, everywhere I look back at my family, for instance, uh, they're trying to cope with something, something <laughs> that has happened mostly not of their own making. That uh, uh, the Ringling family has uh, come out from Wisconsin, bought up half the county, and so my grandparents go to work milking cows for the ringlings. Uh, it didn't take much to look around that three-room shack in Ringling and realizing, hey, somebody here better go out and, and get a wage. And so off I went to a newspaper job in Illinois. 
Uh, then came the move to Seattle to get back, uh, get back west within view of mountains and some water added. And I've stayed on in Seattle. Uh, I suppose it's not been a popular view with, with writers, uh, but the suburbs are, uh, are good for you. But I've always thought they, they are. Uh, people go off to school, go off to work, go off to shop. And so I have, uh, I have this neighborhood to myself. Winter Brothers is a book uh, I was drawn to, drawn to doing by the diaries of James Swan. Um, kept copious diaries out here along Puget Sound, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and all the way out to Cape Flattery for many decades in the 19th century. And so I spent the winter of uh, 1978 and 79 taking the 90 days to go around to the sites where Swan had lived and recorded his things and did a kind of a biography of a journal, I suppose. Cape Flattery is, as I have said, as far west as you can step on the mainland 48 states of America. But along the Cape's Pacific extremity, there are thrusts of cliff actually out above the ocean, ultimate sharp points of landscape, as if a new compass heading had been devised for here, west of west. From a logging road, I climbed down the forest trail to the tip of the Cape's longest finger of headland. At the trailhead, the Macaw Tribal Council has nailed up alarming signs, rugged high cliffs, extremely dangerous area, enter at own risk. The final brink of the trail lives up to them by simply snapping off into midair. Surf pounds underfoot with surprisingly little noise, but wind makes up for it. I crouch carefully, not to be puffed off the continent. Peer out the half mile or so to Tatouche, the lighthouse island here at the entrance to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. I think all writers are regional in the sense that it is their place that gives them uh, a sense of who they are, an identity. All great literature, great art, or, you know, springs from a particular place. I think the landscape defines who we are. Certainly, landscape shapes culture. The notion of, of, uh, of us sitting around writing a literature place bothers me a little bit in that we're not just sitting around out here writing travelogues. I mean, this stuff is hard. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, got, it's got a lot of years and craft and art and everything else. Landscape empty spaces, outdoors, and I think things like that are reflected in the difference between Eastern and Western writing. I try to devise stories that will, in these Navajo series particularly, pull readers into a culture uh, and past things I want them to see so that they, I do teach them something about a, a, a very interesting culture that I think all Americans should know something about. But it's got to be germane to the plot. Now, I'm a Roman Catholic. I disagree frequently with the, with the hierarchy, but I'm, I'm, uh, my faith is important to me. And, uh, when you find people, and you find a lot of them on Indian reservations, who have a faith and a belief, I like those people. I have a great sense of humor. They value wit. So do I. I grew up with all the same kind of things that Navajos grew up with and live in the Hogan. We didn't have indoor plumbing until I was a big teenager. We didn't have a telephone. We didn't have electricity until, again, later on in life. Uh, they rather quickly recognized me as a member of the underclass, you know. On that plaque on the wall was given be, to me by the Navajo tribe as an expression of appreciation and friendship for authentically portraying the strength and dignity of traditional Navajo culture. 
One thing that's probably characteristic of Western writing, or at least more common than it is in the East, is the landscape being germane to the plot. In this book, and in the passage I'm about to read from Thief of Time, the problem is finding a place in an empty, roadless landscape. And the plot turns on that problem. This passage also shows the touchy relationship between the, my two police characters, uh, Joe Lee Porn and Jim Chee. The Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico border country is a maze of washes, gulches, draws, and canyons, thousands of them. And in their sheltered, sun-facing alcoves, literally scores of thousands of Anasazi sites. What Et City had given Lee Porn was like a description of a house in a big city with no idea of its street address. That narrowed it to an area bigger than Connecticut, occupied by maybe 5,000 humans. And all he had was a site description that might be as false as its location obviously was. Perhaps Chi had done better. An odd young man, Chi. Smart, apparently. Alert, but slightly, slightly what? Bent? Not exactly. It wasn't just a business of trying to be a medicine man, a following utterly uncongruous with police work. He was a romantic, Leaporn decided. That was it. A man who followed dreams. She seemed to think an island of 180,000 Navajos could live the old way in a white ocean. Perhaps 20,000 of them could, if they were happy on mutton, cactus, and pinon nuts. Not practical. Navajos had to compete in the real world. The Navajo way didn't teach them competition. Far from it. I've been accused by critics a time or two of, of uh, stopping the action to describe thunderstorms and clouds, and I admit a weakness for that. Lee Porn walked. The sun emerged. In places, the sandstone landscape was littered with hail. In places, the hot stone steamed. The sun was low now and warm against the side of Lee Porn's face. The afterglow faded from the cliff tops. He walked tensely, stopping every few yards, both to listen and to make sure that his breathing remained slow and low. Once he was startled by a sudden scurrying of a rodent, and then, mid-stride, he heard a voice. He stood motionless, straining to hear more. It was a man's voice, coming from somewhere down canyon. Then he heard in the darkness the sound of running and of panting breath. It was coming directly toward him. Lee Porn managed to thumb back the pistol hammer to full cock and half raise the 38. Then, looming out of the darkness, came the bulk of the dog. Lee Porn was able to lunge sideways toward the split clip and jerk the trigger. Amid the thunder of the pistol shot, the dog was on him. It struck him shoulder high. Because of Lee Porn's lunge, the impact was glancing. Lee Porn found himself scrambling frantically upward over the boulders and brush. He squirmed upward, reaching a narrow shelf. There, the dog couldn't possibly reach him. He turned and looked down. He felt the nausea of a system overloaded with adrenaline. He was safe for the moment from the dog, but he was totally exposed to the dog's owner. I don't have, in most of my books, much violence. The mystery tends to be not so much who did it as why it's being done. I, I was a rifleman in the infantry in World War II, and, and you saw a lot of death. I won a couple of decorations, and then I was got badly wounded, and. And then I worked as a police reporter, so you're working around the bad guys. I work myself in the corners all the time, where you don't know exactly what you're going to do next. Well, I'm never going to get involved. I was really in stuck case. on the dark wind. Couldn't find a way to motivate my policeman to be where he needed to be. And uh, so Marie said, why don't you go out on a reservation? And while we were out there, or just before we got out there, somebody had vandalized a windmill. Odd thing to do in dry country. Why would anybody vandalize a windmill? I suddenly been, we could see why somebody might vandalize a windmill. And we hurried home and I finished the book. And it's, the whole book 
revolves around that vandalized windmill. I've written a, about as much, maybe more, nonfiction than fiction. I, I've had a book of essays published. I've written all sorts of the long pieces that hold apart the photos in coffee table books. I have a weakness for empty places. But if you share my taste for isolation, late summer or early spring are ideal times to visit. I like to climb down from the rim to White House ruins, take off my shoes and socks, and splash through the shallow water to the cottonwoods under the cliff dwelling. And up and down the stream, painted on the tough, dark deposits of desert varnish that stain the sandstone, are the pictographs, the work of basket maker Anasazi, Hopi, and Navajo. You wander along the cliffs, finding abstractions, snakes, birds, the familiar humpback shape of Cocapelli playing his flute, a frog, a large man with arms raised in supplication. I think these are messages left for us that we've forgotten how to read. The cliffs remind me of how little space I occupy, the pictographs of how little time. One of the things that's happening in the in, in the West, you know, in a, in a huge social scale, is that is that again, we're having to change our idea of who we are. I think it's easy to stereotype, and I think it's easy to say, yes, there is a character in the American West, and it's the cowboy. I think that's been very damaging, and I think that's an old story. If you just get past the outline of the cowboy hat, there's all this other stuff going on back there, which is a whole hell of a lot more interesting. You begin to get uh, Chicano writers, uh, Native American and uh, Asian writers, say, uh, along the uh, Pacific Coast, uh, women writers writing about their experience, uh, you get a fuller picture. And amongst the minority people, uh, as, as we are writing about our lives, I, I, I feel that we have a very strong sense that we are also uh, creating and building culture. You know, my mother uh, is my great inspiration, but it's not just in a spiritual sense or, or a supportive sense. She actually assigns me things to write about. And she wants to, me to write about unemployment. And um, so right there, I have an assignment to write about an idea. But it's much more interesting to me to um, write about some people who are unemployed. It has to come from a person. You take experience, uh, pain, feelings, and then you, um, put, it, you put it into words then there is a transformation that has taken place that is art. Busy and mine. Yeah. Uh, she's saying that's, oh, that's her husband. That's My her. father came to the U.S. when he was a teenager. They were married in China, and they had, the, they had two children. And then, then he sent for my mother 15 years after he got here. And uh, meanwhile, in China, she got a medical degree, and she was a practicing doctor. Of course, when she got to the United States, she couldn't practice. My mother cut my tongue. She pushed my tongue up and sliced the frenum. Or maybe she snipped it with a pair of nail scissors. I don't remember her doing it, only her telling me about it. Sometimes I felt very proud that my mother committed such a powerful act upon me. At other times, I was terrified. Why did you do that to me, mother? I told you. Tell me again. I cut it so that you would not be tongue-tied. Your tongue would be able to move in any language. She should have cut more, scraped away the rest of the frenum skin, because I have a terrible time talking. A dumbness, a shame, still cracks my voice in two. Even when I want to say hello casually, or ask an easy question in front of the checkout counter, 
or ask questions of a bus driver. The Woman Warrior has a most appropriate subtitle, Memoirs of a Girlhood Among Ghosts, uh, because this is um, very autobiographical, and um, these are memoirs. Night after night, my mother would talk story until we fell asleep. I couldn't tell where the stories left off and the dreams began. After I grew up, I heard the chant of Fa Mutlan, the girl who took her father's place in battle. Instantly, I remembered that as a child, I had followed my mother about the house, the two of us singing about how Fa Mulan fought gloriously and returned alive from war to settle in the village. I would have to grow up a woman warrior. I wrote uh, Woman Warrior and China Man almost as if I were a translator. All the time there was building up in me, well, when do I get to use my language, which is slangy and Berkeley and, uh, and modern and, so I, I just thought, that's what Trip Master Monkey was all about. What Mana Sing is a hip, uh, post-beatnik, pre-hippie uh, of the mid-60s. Whitman stood at the bus stop on the corner of Arguello and Fulton. He was avoiding the corner where the grizzly bear on one rock and the mountain lion with tense shoulders on the opposite rock looked down at you. The Muni bus came along on the cables not too much later. On the ride downtown, out the bus window, he kept spotting people who offended him in their postures and gestures, their walks, their nose blowing, their clothes, their facial expressions. Normal humanity, mean and wrong. Out of a pocket, he took his Rilke. For such gone days, he carried the notebooks of Malta Lord's Briga in his pea coat and read out loud to his fellow riders. None of the passengers was telling Whitman to cool it. It was pleasant then for them to ride the bus while Rilke shaded and polished the city's grays and golds. Whitman has begun a someday tradition that may lead to a job as a reader riding the railroads through the West. Along the Big Sur Ocean, Jack Kerouac. On the way to Weed of Mice and Men, in the mother load, Mark Twain and Robert Louis Stevenson. Travelers will go to the reading car to hear the long novels of the country they were riding through for hours and for days. Whitman's talent was that he could read while riding without getting car sick. Whitman has just um, put on a show in which he's included everybody he knows. And uh, the reviews have just come in and uh, he's reading them on stage. Look, look, East meets West, exotic, Sino-American theater, snaps, crackles, and pops like singing rice, sweet and sour. They sent their food critics. They, they wrote us up like they were tasting Chinese food. They think they know us, the wide range of us, from sweet to sour because they eat in Chinese restaurants. I think, he tried explaining, that history being trapped in people means that history is embodied in physical characteristics. And do you know what part of our bodies they find so mysteriously inscrutable? It's our little eyes. They think we're sneaky, squinting at them through spy eyes. And that's why you girls are slicing your eyelids open, isn't it? I don't want to kiss eyes that have been cut and sewn, like she ate something too hot, the jalapeno look. She'll have to meet new guys who will believe she was born like that. She'll draw black lines on top of the scars and date white guys who don't care one way or the other, single lid, double lid. <laughs> Zip into the city quick, past El Barrio Chino and up Telegraph Hill to Coit Tower. Whitman Park next to Christopher Columbus. 
Welcome to my estate, Tanya, said Whitman, as he opened the car door for her. They went up the stairs that were the stairway of Rita Hayworth's mansion in Pal Joey. The elevator doors were in the middle of a mural about workers turning wheels of cable. A tower of WPA artwork, women in white hats and aprons assembling milk. The Golden Gate, the most bridge-like of bridges, swept them from the Green Presidio to the Marin Hills, where the Manzanita and the bridge are the same red. Fog poured out of the forest. His grandmother liked being taken for Sunday drives. Tanya would enjoy meeting her. They didn't have to worry about meeting Tanya's family. White people don't have families. They're free. Seems to me about the only thing that Western writing really lacks is critics smart enough to get it. I'm always amazed when a critic uh, reads a piece of work from the West and understands. Then I think it's a great surprise. I've uh, seen my uh, work reviewed as, uh, as if I were Chinese um, and not as if I were an American Western writer. And we sing and we dance and we write poems and we tell stories. And who in the hell cares if the, West, if the Eastern critic likes it or not? Well, we were a colony. We're also an emotional and intellectual colony of the East for a long, long, long time. And uh, now we're not, and, uh, or nearly so much. The West is really uh, defining itself as another country, a kind of separate area. And you know, Newsweek said a couple of years ago that you know, Westerners are reading from another bookshelf. Uh, and there are new people every time you look around. And it's wonderful, great writers. It's amusing, but does it belong in this story? The students we get here now are quite wonderful, and they come here uh, to the West, I think, because they can participate in the future here in ways they don't feel like they can participate in the future in lots of parts of America or the world. Um, and the consequent, we're getting brilliant people. I think it ought to be funny. I'm not, I, I don't want you to think that I'm trying to push you away from writing funny stories. But... Onyx Smith and I edited uh, an anthology of Montana writing called The Last Best Place, and she's published one poem, made uh, two or three films, uh, published two or three short stories, published a lot of essays. Uh, everybody, uh, you know, needs that kind of intellectual companionship. Our first reader tonight is going to be William Kittredge, the originator of the uh, catchy regional phrase, Montana, the last best place. <laughs> Thanks, yes. Bill. <laughs> The continual fretting is ultimately a way of wasting what time we have. In my own long run, I have come to agree with Montaigne as he speaks of himself in that last great essay of experience, which I take to be about making the best of what we get. He quotes Seneca, the life of the fool is joyless, full of trepidation, given over wholly to the future. Most of it, <laughs> that's his heart. <laughs> Play wisdom says, turn your attention to the woven energies of what is. Is there an old natural way of being human and comfortable? Part of it is quieting down, looking, touching, listening, licking, smelling. We know the rituals of intimacy. Are we capable of fearing not? And there, I'll shut up. Thank you. <laughs> We're Not in This Together is a story that started in my imagination in the middle 1970s when a friend of mine, a, a woman named Mary Pat Mahoney, who was a, a student actually and, and someone I knew quite well, was uh, uh, dragged out of a tent in Glacier Park by a grizzly bear and, and um, part ways eaten. And uh, after a while I thought, well, if this, this upsets you so much you ought to try writing about it, I guess. It's probably material. You know, I'll make something out of it if you can. And so I began to try to write this story. It took probably three years. There were no clouds anywhere in the long sky reaching off south and west from the peaks. Quartz Lake shone under the late afternoon sun. Early that day, Halverson had spent the morning climbing along the southern rise of the drainage when he heard the dry crackling of a limb breaking out on this open burn slope. But this was Darby, not a bear. She had followed him all this way into his idea of what he had to do. It was Darby who first saw the bear. 
Do you see him? Who? Down over there. There it was, head down. Halverson wondered what he should do now, which move to make. What you can do is go down there with your knife, Darby said. You can slide up closer and closer, and I'll do the shooting. See if you can do it, Halverson said, and he slid a cartridge into the firing chamber and handed the rifle to Darby. She took it like she had been waiting. Only when he moved closer, low to the ground, looking upward through the leafy green brush, did Halverson at last see the animal. He was being watched. The grunting had stopped, and Halverson looked up, and saw the bear reared and gazing down on him, and nothing but curious. The dark eyes were soft, and the terrible odor was a stench. With the knife still upraised, Halverson waited this close. And you'll have to read it to find out what happens at the end. I'm still not sure in certain ways what it says, but it says something about the fact that revenge is a bad idea. I grew up on a, on a, on a, on a ranch in the outback of eastern Oregon, and, and uh, at the end of the Second World War, my grandfather traded off about 200 work teams for uh, John Deere tractors, and everything went mechanized. We kind of went into agribusiness, and everything thereafter was, was changed. I've written about that life in, in, in several essays, uh, quite directly in, in, in uh, owning it all. We drained and leveled, ditched and pumped, and for a long while our crops were all any of us could have asked. There were over 5,000 water control devices. We constructed a perfect agricultural place, and it was sacred, so it seemed. And then it all went dead over years, but swiftly. There lay an alkaline flatland. Our peat soil began to go saline. Leaning on the tailgate of my pickup, I first came to my awareness that this valley where I had always lived had gone lifeless in some terrible way, and I was frightened. At that point, I was 35 or 6 years old, and I thought, you know, I really don't want to do this anymore. I really am not interested in being here. I was, I'd always, I was completely nuts about books and trying to write and all this sort of thing at that time. And uh, I remember I was also getting a divorce. I, I, I lived fairly recklessly for a while. I remember my father coming to visit me, and he said, what in the world are you going to do with yourself? And I told him I was going to go back to graduate school and become a writer. For a long time, there was, there was a whole society in, in that part of the West that, uh, I mean, it's a hard-driving, hard-drinking, hell-raising society, and I got right in the middle of it. Where I like to head out of Missoula is upstream along the Blackfoot River, the asphalt weaving and dipping with some fine, thin, fragile music cutting out from the tape deck. Such music is important in the early day. It always seems like a good idea, those mornings up along the Blackfoot, to stop at the wheel in on the near outskirts of Lincoln. One drink for the road and some banter with a hippie girl tending bar, but wrong. After the first hesitation, more stopping at such establishments is inevitable and quite enjoyable one after another. Soon that fine blue bowl of heaven and your exquisite freedom are forgotten. No more Vivaldi. It's only noon. You're playing tapes and singing along, wondering if you could have made it in the country music business. By now, you are a long and dangerous way from home and somewhat disoriented. You have drifted into another mythology called Lonesome Traveling and Lost Highways, a place where you really don't want to be on such a fine spring day. Once it seemed like pure release to learn you could vote with your feet, or better yet, load your gear in some old beater pickup truck and drive. For some of us, the consequences of such escape tended to evolve sitting alone with a pint bottle of whiskey. The concept was grand and theatrical, but doing it, getting away, was oftentimes an emotional rat's nest of rootlessness. Country music, all that worn out drifter syncopation, turned out to be another lie, a terrific sport, but a real thin way of life. Yo -de -yo -de -yo -de -yo -de -yo. The big issues of life, rather than the shoebox mentalities of you sometimes get off of, you should pardon the expression, Manhattan Island, where the imagined affronts of a parent 30 years ago or somebody you went to school with becomes the little musical chord for your novel. Um, the themes are a lot bigger, the consequences are a lot bigger out here. We first have to look at what we see out the window when we're reading the book. Uh, uh, what's out there is different. 
we want the world to be preserved. We think the world is alive in some kind of way, many of us at least in the West, and I think in lots of other places in the world. But here, uh, it's so clearly before us all the time because we're outdoors, we're in the world, uh, the natural world so much. If there's a renaissance in Western writing, I think it's because as a people we are recognizing what we are losing and we are losing our land. And therefore, I think many of us are writing out of a sense of loss, um, writing out of a sense of love, writing out of a desperate attempt to preserve what remains. From my point of view, being a Westerner is, is digging in, staying put, and, and feeling a deep sense of connectedness and rootedness. My ancestors' bones lie here, and um, I feel certain that mine will too. You know, we live in Immigration Canyon. We live right on the Mormon Trail, and so there isn't a day that goes by that we don't come out of the canyon and, and think about Brigham Young looking out over the valley and saying, this is the place. And there are those of us who still believe that. Um, I'm one of those. And, um, and it means something to me that my people came here out of a sense of spiritual sovereignty. So I guess that's Western. I belong to a clan of one-breasted women. My mother, my grandmothers, and six aunts have all had mastectomies. Seven are dead. The two who survive have just completed rounds of chemotherapy and radiation. I've had my own problems. Two biopsies for breast cancer and a small tumor between my ribs diagnosed as a borderline malignancy. This is my family history. We are a Mormon family with roots in Utah since 1847 and only one faced breast cancer prior to 1960. Traditionally, as a group of people, Mormons have a low rate of cancer. A little over a year after mother's death, my father and I were having dinner together. Over dessert, I shared a recurring dream of mine. I told my father that for years, as long as I could remember, I saw this flash of light in the night in the desert, that this image had so permeated my being that I could not venture south without seeing it again on the horizon, illuminating buttes and mesas. You did see it, he said. Saw what? The bomb, the cloud. We were driving home from Riverside, California. You were sitting on Diane's lap. We were driving north past Las Vegas. It was an hour or so before dawn when this explosion went off. We pulled over and suddenly, rising from the desert floor, we saw it clearly, this golden stemmed cloud, the mushroom. And within a few minutes, a light ash was raining on the car. I stared at my father. I thought you knew that, he said. It was a common occurrence in the 50s. It was at that moment that I realized the deceit I had been living under, children growing up in the American Southwest, drinking contaminated milk from contaminated cows, even from the contaminated breasts of their mothers, my mother, members, years later, of the clan of one-breasted women. You know, I think you, you uncover stories like this in your family history, and um, you're no longer comfortable. Um, I crossed a line, not only metaphorically, but physically. And I think that's where um, I made the, the personal t decision to commit civil disobedience with other women from Utah, with other family members, um, not only in the name of peace, but in the name of the clan of one-breasted women. And I think this is where, once again, a poetics of place, the bird refuge, a passion of the land, of the natural world, of wings and water, unknowingly gave birth to a politics of place, where we literally do stand our ground in the places that we love. That that sacred rage propels not only the writing, but our lives. Refuge is the story of the rise of Great Salt Lake during the floods of the 1980s and the demise of the Bear River Bird Refuge and also about my mother's diagnosis with cancer. 
I am reminded that what I adore, admire, and draw from mother is inherent in the earth. My mother's spirit can be recalled simply by placing my hands on the black hummus of mountains or the lean sands of desert. Her love, her warmth, and her breath, even her arms around me, are the waves, the wind, the sunlight, and water. Water in the American West is blood. Rivers, streams, creeks become arteries, veins, capillaries. Dam, dike, or drain any of them, and somewhere, silence prevails. No water, no fish. No water, no plants. No water, no life, nothing breathes. The land body becomes a corpse. Where there is water, the desert is verdant. There is something unnerving about my solitary travels around the northern stretches of Great Salt Lake. You stand in the throbbing silence of the Great Basin, exposed and alone. In the severity of a salt desert, I am brought down to my knees by its beauty. My imagination is fired, my heart opens and my skin burns in the passion of these moments. I will have no other gods before me. Many of the teachings within the Mormon church I love deeply. The sense of family, the sense of community, um, the sense of accountability, the work ethic, um, prayer. All of those things are central to my life as a spiritual practice. There are other things that I don't feel comfortable with. Um, the sense of patriarchy, um, the dogma that is with any religion. It is both a blessing and a burden. And there is that shadow side. Um, and maybe that's what I mean when I talk about writing out of a broken heart. Um, it's never easy to defy convention. And I think every time a writer picks up a pen, you are breaking loyalties. Because if we tell the truth, we have to. That is wonderful. I know, it's this courtship dance. The female with the low posture and the male kind of showering her with water. A neurotics of place. My life is a shared life, and that is with Brooke, and we've been married 20 years. D.H. Lawrence writes, in every living thing there is a desire for love for the relationship of unison with the rest of things. I think of my own stream of desires, how cautious I have become with love. And when I refuse an intimate's love or hoard my spirit, or when a known landscape is bought, sold, and developed, chained or grazed to a stubble, or when a hawk is shot and hung by its feet on a barbed wire fence, my heart cannot be broken because I never risk giving it away. But what kind of impoverishment is this? To withhold emotion, to restrain our passionate nature in the face of a generous life just to appease our fears. A man or woman whose mind reigns in the heart when the body sings desperately for connection can only expect more isolation and greater ecological disease. Our lack of intimacy with each other is in direct proportion to our lack of intimacy with the land. We have taken our love inside and abandoned the wild. There is something in the West of, that says, um, I, I am going to find it, but, oh, I didn't find it. So where is it? So I have to keep going. Uh, people have moved around a lot out here simply because, uh, among other things, boom and bust has made them uh, uh, go hither and yon as, uh, as work presented itself or didn't. I think Western writing tends to reflect uh, naturally the kind of people who are attracted to the West. And, and uh, they tend to be people who haven't got deep roots. You have to realize that there's no place to progress to pretty quick and that uh, what we need to do is stay put and take care. 
when you look at the Navajo people, the Shoshone people, um, the Ute people here in Utah, uh, we do have models for deep inhabitation, but I don't think as a Westerner of European descent, we don't know that yet. And that's what I think we're in the process of, of discovering. I think we have to add to that formula the, the Spanish-Mexican influence of the West that uh, predates Anglo-America by centuries. Frank Dominic is a multimillionaire who lives in uh, Alburquerque and has great plans for it. He wants to build uh, canals throughout the downtown area, gambling casinos. Dominic tapped the steering wheel as he sat at the stoplight at Rio Grande and Central. This was Old Town, La Plaza Vieja, the center of old Alburquerque. The place was an important tourist attraction with its plaza, the old San Felipe de Neri Church, shops and restaurants, and already the Old Town merchants were complaining about Dominic's plan. They claimed they would lose business if the canal system bypassed them. Hell, he would triple their business. He, Francisco Dominic, would create the new Alburquerque. Abran is the uh, main character of the novel, a young man um, who's talented as a Golden Gloves boxer, and uh, Frank Dominic uh, takes him as under his wing and uh, tries to use him. Abran gritted his teeth and his hands clenched the steering wheel until his knuckles turned white. Damn you, Dominic, his cry echoed in the dark. He started the car and drove down Edith towards Central. Homeless people wandered up and down the street, looking for shelter for the night, looking for the safety of the underpass where they could huddle in their cardboard boxes. Homeless people I haven't seen before, Abran thought. Why? Were they waiting for Dominic to offer his pie-in-the-sky plan? It was crazy. Dominic didn't give a damn about these people. Nobody did. They were, like Abran, shadows without hope. The people on the street had lost in love, lost jobs, lost their health, lost respect. They were shadows you didn't see until you felt lost. I think writing is a very strict discipline. You have to go to your work like anybody else goes. You also have to, in a sense, meditate on what you're doing. Uh, Enter, enter the world you're creating. I ran up the steps and entered the dark, musky church. I genuflected at the font of holy water, wet my fingertips, and made the sign of the cross. The lines were already formed on either side of the confessional, and the kids were behaving and quiet. Each one stood with bowed head, preparing himself to confess all of his sins to Father Burns. I closed my eyes and tried not to be distracted by anything around me. I thought hard of all the sins I had ever committed, and as I said, many prayers as I could remember. I begged God forgiveness for my sins over and over, but I was not satisfied. The God I so eagerly sought was not there, and the understanding I thought to gain was not there. I have had more priests recommend Bless Me Ultima to their congregations and to people um, than any other group, probably. Because if you're sincere about faith, then you know that there is always crisis that comes when one tries to achieve faith. I was raised in uh, Santa Rosa, a small town in uh, eastern New Mexico, large family. My father had done a, a lot of ranching in his younger days. He was a vaquero. One of the things that uh, I remember about my childhood is that somehow I never missed not having things. Life was very rich, e even though in terms of money, it couldn't be measured, <laughs> it was not rich at all. 
And bless me, Ultima Antonio opens up his mind, which is what Ultima does. And what she represents is, I would say, a kind of Native American guide for him, a mentor. Uh, so whereas before he's had the teachings of the Catholic religion and whatever it had to do with Western civilization, now he sees his indigenous roots, which are Native American. Now it is up to Antonio to create a synthesis to bring those together. Ultima came to stay with us the summer I was almost seven. When she came, the beauty of the Llano unfolded before my eyes. My bare feet felt the throbbing earth and my body trembled with excitement. I stepped forward and took Ultima's hand. Antonio, she smiled. Then I felt the power of a whirlwind sweep around me. Her eyes swept the surrounding hills and through them, I saw for the first time the wild beauty of our hills and the magic of the green river. The granules of sand at my feet and sky above me seemed to dissolve into one strange, complete being. And with Ultima came the owl. Its soft hooting was like a song. Its song seemed to say that it had come to watch over us. I knew that those hills cradled the mysterious hidden lakes, but I had never been there. It was a beautiful spot. The pond was dark and clear, and the water trickled and gurgled over the top of the dam. Kiko pointed, the golden carp will come through there. We sat for a long time. Then the golden carp came. The huge, beautiful form glided through the blue waters. I could not believe its size. It was bigger than me and bright orange. The sunlight glistened off his golden scales. I felt my body trembling as I saw the bright golden form disappear. I knew I had witnessed a miraculous thing, the appearance of a pagan god. I entered Ultima's room softly. Only a candle burned in the room, and by its light I saw Ultima lying on the bed. I placed the owl by her side and knelt at the side of the bed. The owl is dead, was all I could say. Not dead, she smiled weakly, but winging its way to a new place, a new time, just as I am ready to fly. Ultima, I wanted to cry out, don't die, Ultima. I wanted to rip death away from her and the owl. Shh. She whispered, go west into the hills until you find a forked juniper tree. There, bury the owl. Go quickly. I dropped to my knees. Bless me, Ultima. Her hand touched my forehead, and her last words were, I bless you in the name of all that is good and strong and beautiful, Antonio. And if despair enters your heart, look for me in the evenings when the wind is gentle and the owls sing in the hills. I shall be with you. The spirit of those places where we can be um, rejuvenated, regenerated, and understand our spiritual connection to the earth uh, have to be preserved. And the developers of the West don't understand that. So I think it's very incumbent upon us as uh, poets and writers to remind uh, our communities of that uh, relationship that we have and how important. And if we lose it, um, we lose part of our humanity. A lot of writers in the West are trying to talk about uh, uh, getting back into contact with the self that we are, with who we really are and what we really want. I, I feel that we're building the culture of the West. I push the edges on this stuff. That's, that's where the greatness lies. A good story is number one. Is this unspoken hunger that can only be addressed and fed through the land, 
through our relationship to the earth, to something other. I feel very connected to family and community uh, and the spirituality of the place. Mm -hmm.